Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to BC214, our course on developing the human spirit. Let's pray and get started. Could somebody please pray and we will start. Please pray. Father, we thank you for this day, for this time, Lord. Once again, we can do a great job in this show. Please, thank you for the most kindness in our lives, Lord. We want to start with that. Help us, Lord. And it's a great thing to help us to understand, Lord. We need to be just thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So, um, last week we started talking about the interactions of uh, the human spirit with the spiritual realm the human spirit and its interactions with the spiritual realm that is in lesson number five um, so uh, our focus is on the born again human spirit that means for the how our spirit that's been born again interacts with the spiritual world but please also keep in mind that even the unsaved, even the unbeliever, even their spirit can interact with the spiritual realm. Just that they're not saved, that means they're not interacting with God necessarily. Most of the time, they're interacting with the powers of darkness. Right? So it is not that they, uh, the unbeliever doesn't have a spirit. The unbeliever has a spirit human spirit but it is away from the life of god it is not connected to jesus christ it's not connected to the life of god but it can interact with the spiritual realm and uh, you know things can happen so that's why even uh, these un unbelievers they will you know they will be able to tell uh, uh, fortune telling uh, witchcraft uh, they get those kinds of powers but from that dark source powers of darkness they get those kinds of powers so they are interacting with the spiritual realm in a in in, in the in the in the dark realm we are focusing on how we interact with god right so yes question yes is there any so you speak in the mic uh, so they can hear. Is there any possibility for them to interact with God? God, God, yes, the answer is yes. That means God can intervene. So God can give them dreams, God can give them vision, even for the unbeliever. I'm not saying that will never happen. There are many examples. Even the Bible, Cornelius. Uh, yeah, his name was Cornelius. Yeah, the Roman centurion. He was a devout man, but he was not a believer. He's a, he was a religious man. And God, the Lord, speaks to him, sends an angel. And he tells him, you send for Peter, who is in uh, Joppa. Tell him to come. You know, so God is, God, even God speaks to the unbeliever. Uh, God can give them visions and so on. So and they can have encounters with God. Right? But uh, um, many of them who are pursuing spiritual power would be pursuing it through the dark realm, you know, by doing all kinds of things. So what we said was that our human spirit is the place where as God gives us knowledge and as God gives revelation, our human spirit is, is where we will know everything about ourselves. Because God is giving that knowledge in our spirit. Okay? So, so what is God's plan for my life? Most of the time, that understanding will come to you in your spirit. Okay? That means something inside you will say, this is what I should be doing in my life. Why? Because God is speaking to you there. Because the Holy Spirit is giving you revelation there in your spirit. So in your spirit, you're first going to understand God's plan and purpose for your life. 
uh, about making decisions, so many things, right? It comes first to your spirit. The spirit of man within him is what really knows the things of God, and God gives it there. Hmm? Then it comes to your understanding. You begin to understand, then you will process it, you will make plans, all that. That is fine. But it starts in the spirit. So we also said the Holy Spirit bears witness with our spirit. Romans chapter 8, we looked at that. right? And the Holy Spirit gives revelation to our human spirit. Okay, That means it is in our human spirit where the Holy Spirit is going to give us revelation. Revelation means things that we did not know, which now we begin to understand. Your spirit begins to understand. Right? It's like the eyes being opened to see. Right? Your eyes open, the eyes of your spirit is open to see, and you begin to understand in your spirit. Okay, so revelation comes to us in our spirit. The fruit of the spirit is also developed in our spirit. So, you know, in Galatians 5, we read about the fruit of the spirit. Hmm? Love, joy, peace, kindness, meekness, gentleness, self-control. Fruit of the spirit. How does it happen? The Holy Spirit, working upon our human spirit, produces fruit there. He develops these traits or these characteristics or character in our spirit. That means your human spirit is able to love, be patient, be kind, be gentle, have faith, etc. In your human spirit, with the help of the Holy Spirit then that has to come out in your life, life, right? Through your soul and through your actions, through your words, that has to be expressed. But first, it is a fruit of the Spirit in our human spirit. Now, it is interesting, in the Greek, there is only one word for spirit, pneuma. Whether it's Holy Spirit, human spirit, evil spirit, only one word, pneuma. So in Galatians chapter 5, it says, But the fruit of the pneuma is love, joy, peace, kindness, meekness. No? So some people will interpret as the fruit of the human spirit. Okay. Which is not wrong. But how it is developed in the human spirit? It is by the help of the Holy Spirit. You must understand, right? It is the Holy Spirit working on our spirit that these qualities are developed. And we don't get it by our own strength. No? It's not like, oh, I will somehow get it. No. We are getting, we, are, we, we develop those qualities from the help of, with the help of the Holy Spirit. So it's okay. Sometimes, you know, you might hear, you might read some books or you might hear some people preach, oh, it is a fruit of your human spirit. That is true, because there's only one Greek word, pneuma. But where does the human spirit get it? From the Holy Spirit. So that's why in that same chapter in Galatians 5, Paul is saying, walk in the Spirit. Live in the Spirit. Be led by the Spirit. You know, In all these three cases, it's the same word, pneuma. So you could interpret it as human spirit or Holy Spirit. It is okay. right? But understand that he's speaking to believers. So obviously, their human spirit is in submission to the Holy Spirit. So that is what it means, led by the Spirit. The human spirit subject to the Holy Spirit. Live in the Spirit. Human spirit subject to the Holy Spirit. Walk in the Spirit. Human spirit subject to the Holy Spirit. Then you have the fruit of the Spirit. The human spirit subject to the Holy Spirit. So everything is coming from the Holy Spirit through the human spirit. That's how we are to live. Okay. And we also saw that uh, God works through our spirit. So uh, we saw in John 7, Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living. What? Where? It's coming from your innermost being. That is your Holy Spirit, your spirit. 
the Holy Spirit is flowing out of your spirit. Right? So yes, the expression will take place through my soul and my body. That means I will be speaking words or I'll be doing some action. That is true. But where does it come from? Out of your innermost being, from your spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to flow. So Holy Spirit is not flowing just through my body or through my mind. So even though, remember, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That doesn't mean just on the body. He's saying, I will pour out my spirit on every person. But how does the Holy Spirit flow? Out of your innermost being, out of your spirit, the Holy Spirit is going to flow. So the gifts of the spirit also happen like that. It starts in the spirit, your human spirit. You receive a word, you receive an impression or you receive a revelation, or you receive a vision, whatever. It's starting in your spirit. From there you release. You understand, right? So, that for us as believers, keeping our human spirit in good condition is very important. Right? Especially if you're going to do ministry, keeping that as a good condition is important. So you can imagine like this, right? Suppose even here in this building, I think there must be an overhead tank. Tank is suppose tank is full, water is full. But if the tube, which is ring water, yeah, if it is dirty or if it is clogged or if it is broken, then that there's nothing wrong with the water supply. But because the tube, which is, and you can imagine, that's like our human spirit, no, the channel through which the Holy Spirit is being flow, released, that is not clean or something is blocking, uh, then the Holy Spirit will not have freedom of expression through that person. Or sometimes the spirit may be very good, but sometimes our block may be in the soul, mind. Mind is always questioning why, why, how, when, where. <laughs> Our own mind is questioned. So spirit is good, but mind is questioned. So then that may be a next block. Right? So both our spirit and our soul has to be a, a good channel for the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, another aspect, another aspect is that there are many different kinds of spiritual experiences that we can have. Okay, spiritual experience. That means uh, different kinds of experiences which our spirit can have, but God gives that to us as He desires. So it's not like, you know, you and I, God, today come to me like a cloud, tomorrow like a rain. <laughs> it's not like uh, you and I asking, you know, when yeah, you can desire, Lord, I want more of you. I want, I want to feel your presence. I want to hear your voice. That way we can desire. But we can't tell, dictate to God, today I want to come to the third heaven, tomorrow I want to appointment with Gabriel, <laughs> day after tomorrow I want appointment with Michael. We can't do those kinds of things, right? It is those things, the spiritual experiences are God-given. Like God will give us those different experiences. From our side, we can desire God, more of Him more of knowing Him, more closeness with Him. That is a good desire. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. So you desire for God. Now how He will respond to you will be different. To you, to one person, maybe He gives more revelation. To another person, maybe He uh, uh, lets them in, in encounter their presence in a certain way. To another person, maybe, you know, some they have made dreams and visions. Another person, maybe uh, they may have encounters with angels or whatever. So different people have different uh, things. How God responds to each one is different. But what we can all do is we can desire for God. We can desire for more of God. But what we're doing now is we're just going to mention some of these spiritual experiences. Just for us to keep be open. 
Francis. Francis has a question. Yes. Yes, yes. Because you see, even in the Psalms, right? You see David praying many times. You know, he says, As the deer pants for the water broke, so longs my soul after you, O God. Huh? Or Psalm 63, you know, he says, My soul longs for you. My soul thirsts for you. When can I come and uh, appear before you? You know, so even he says, even in the night, I lift up my hands, I cry out to you, right? So in many Psalms, Psalm 119, many throw that Psalm, uh, the Psalmist is crying out for God. I say, I, I'm, I'm waiting for you. Even in the night times, I'm waiting for you. Through your word, I'm seeking you. So the answer is yes. You know, we can cry out for God, for more of God. God, I want more of you. Yeah? And then God definitely will answer because the Bible says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Definitely will answer. Draw near to God, he will draw near to you. How he answers may be so different in different ways, many different ways. He keeps, he'll respond in our own lives, right? So uh, we're just going to make a list of uh, spiritual experience just to keep our minds open. For example, in Moses, God said, I come to you in the thick cloud. You know, I come to you in the thick cloud. So God is giving a tangible expression. Thick cloud, you see. Right? Can God do that today? Yes, he can. Uh, we will we'll talk a little bit about why we don't see so much of this, but can God do it? He can. Right? He Moses saw a cloud. Or the glory of God came like a cloud in the midst of those people. Right? There was also, um, uh, yeah, so here's a many examples, the pillar of cloud and the glory of God filled the tabernacle. For Isaiah, he had a vision. It was a very powerful experience in Isaiah 6. He has a vision and he is seeing the throne room. He is seeing God, uh, the throne room, the, uh, the, the angelic, angelic beings worshipping God. And he is seeing the, uh, the glory of God just like a robe, which is extending limitless. You know, And he is having that encounter. And in that encounter with God, he is also seeing... Uh, he, he responds to God. He feels his own sinfulness. And then an angel comes. He takes the coal from the uh, throne room of God and he touches his lips. You know? Um, so that's not a physical experience, right? It's a spiritual experience. Spiritually, that is having that experience that God is cleansing my lips, you know, through this, this, this way. That's a very powerful experience. So sometimes we could have those kinds of experiences. Yeah. Ezekiel has so many different kinds of experiences. For example, uh, he's having an experience where God is telling him, eat, eat a scroll. Now, obviously, it's not natural. You can't imagine God saying, eat this. <laughs> you can't bite them. <laughs> you can't bite and eat. You know, it's not, not a natural. It's a spiritual experience. But it has meaning. Right? God is saying, take my words, because you're going to go and prophesy. You're going to give my words to the people, right? So eat my words, receive my words. Uh, there are many times, many, many times, that he's carried in the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is taking him and showing him other places, or what other people are doing. Mm -hmm. Spiritual experience, right? And, uh, and, and, and he begins to... I say that, you know, like two Sundays ago, uh, in the, no, no, that when I was preaching in Central, uh, oh, that was the message on the power of the tongue, I think. And while I was preaching, uh, I was just giving what, okay, it was like as though I was giving an example. But in those words that I was saying, I was like almost saying the words that, one of the people was sitting there was saying, and the moment I said those words, she just broke down crying. You know, she was sitting there on the second row. She just broke down crying, and she was just crying the rest of the service, sermon. 
I was a little embarrassing because she and her friend were sitting right there on the second row, listening to the message. But she was crying, and she was crying quite, quite loudly. Like I could hear, but I didn't stop to, you know, ask what and all because oh, so other people are also listening to the sermon. I can't stop it. But I knew that, and I, this was not planned. Like I didn't plan. Okay, I'm going to give this as an example. I usually don't plan the examples. Very rarely I might think of an example ahead of time, but usually I don't. But at that moment, while I was preaching or sharing the word, those words that I said, I knew were exactly words that that she was saying. So I just said it and she broke down. Then I then afterwards, you know, her friend brought her for prayer. And uh, while I was talking to her again, I could sense you know that okay, this is her problem one of the things she, she's going through some some you know uh, a, a, a crisis a difficult situation so again i said you know uh, don't say these things about yourself and i said and she was like those are the exact words i've been saying and so two times that sunday morning right, once when she was listening and once she came when she her friend brought her forward she was still crying a friend brought up over it. Those were the exact. So, and I knew at that time that I was not speaking from my head, right? I was not saying this because, oh, be, oh be, let's be nice to this person. No, no. I was saying it because it's coming out of my spirit. You know? And I knew that this is what she's been saying or speaking about herself in her life. You know? And it's really ministered to her. You know? So there are times that, that you're just ministering out of your spirit and uh, these things can happen. The Holy Spirit is gi giving you the words uh, to speak, right? So, um, so in Ezekiel, we see the Spirit lifted him up and took him away. So that means Holy Spirit is taking him somewhere, and he's feeling it. I went in bitterness, in the heat of my spirit, right? So he's experiencing. Holy Spirit is giving him an experience. He's showing him places, and he's, he's having that reaction. He can sense. That the Holy Spirit is doing. Another place in Ezekiel 8, he says, The Holy Spirit, a hand, hand like a hand, took me by the hair and lifted me up. So literally, it's like feeling, he's feeling as somebody's catching his hair and lifting him up. Obviously, it's not physical, right? It's not physically somebody's lifting him up. But spiritually, he's feeling like that. As though somebody is holding him, taking him up, and uh, in vision he is seeing what's happening in uh, another place in Jerusalem. So these kind of experiences God can also give to us today, right? So, uh, uh, and uh, we can uh, have those things through which the Holy Spirit is actually it is a spiritual experience, right? That means this is an experience in His human spirit from the Holy Spirit. But he's using natural language, like, oh, somebody caught me by my hair and lifted me up, took me in the middle and showed me these things, right? He's using natural language, but actually it is a spiritual experience. In the spirit, he's having this, right? Another, many, Ezekiel 11 also, the Holy Spirit lifted me up, he brought me towards the gate, and he showed me these five men, 25 men, they, he saw the people, he recognizes some of them. Uh, they are sitting there and they're having some discussion. In Ezekiel 43, uh, the Holy Spirit is bringing him to inside the temple and he's showing him about the temple being filled with the glory of God. So these are spiritual experiences. If you see this even with Daniel, right? Daniel had visions and dreams. Uh, he had um, angels come to him. Right? What we see is in Daniel, Daniel 7.15, his spiritual experience was so powerful, it affected his soul and body. He was, uh, uh, he says, yeah, uh, the visions of the, my head troubled me and I was grieved in my spirit. It, it, it Meaning I was so disturbed, I, I, you know, he, he couldn't even go to work. I'm, I'm not saying don't go to work, but, you know, it affected him so much. Some of the visions, the spiritual experiences. 
uh, and of course he also has uh, angels come and talk to him and angel Gabriel comes and talks to Daniel giving him message and understanding of the dreams so uh, and then when the angel touches Daniel he receives strength to stand up you know sometimes he falls flat angels touches and gets strength to stand up yeah. so spiritual experience affecting the soul and the body and we know of others in the New Testament you know Paul the Apostle he was caught up to the third heavens and he heard things about God he says I can't even come and share that with you you know I can't express it to you the things I heard and saw you know, such were the experiences and of course John the beloved we know he was caught up to heaven and God gave him the revelation of things to come you know and he wrote the book of revelation so uh, many different kinds of spiritual experiences so we talked about the normal things which would be like being led by the spirit uh, the fruit of the spirit the manifestations of the spirit or the gifts of the spirit those are common all of us experience it but then there are these unusual experiences which can happen and we should be sensitive open to it uh, but there is this question you know should we ask God for these experiences because sometimes you'll hear some people pray ask God to take you to heaven ask God do you want to go to the third heaven ask God uh, to send his angels so you want to talk to the angels or uh, you know those kinds of things you'll hear some people preach those kinds of things my thing is this my opinion about my 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 uh, what to say my position about that is ask god for more of god ask god for more of him not the spiritual experience you say god you know i'd like to have it's okay you know i like to have these okay you can tell god you like to have it but don't go after the experience go after god and how and what experience he gives you, leave that to the Lord. Because the danger in going after the experience is because even the devil can duplicate it. Okay, devil also can duplicate. And sometimes people are so uh, interested in that experience. Then when they have the experience, you don't know whether it's really God or the devil giving them that experience. Some angel came and spoke to me. Okay. You have to test it. Right? And you have to make sure that whatever that angel told you is correct according to the word. Otherwise, it could be some other angel. You know? So, that's what I would always encourage us is, yes, uh, pursue God and say, God, I'm open. I'd like to have, you know, I'd like to, you know, whatever you want to give me. No, I'd like to hear from you. I'd like to know you. I'd like to receive revelation. I'd like to encounter your presence. I'd like to, I want more of you. You know, but then how that happens, you leave it to God and be open. Be open, but leave it to God. And also, everything has to be discerned, it has to be tested. You know, you have a vision, you have a dream, test it. Is that from God? Is it not from God? Right? So don't just accept every uh, spiritual experience you have you have to test everything and evaluate it okay um go ahead you have a question uh, Sorry, say that again. Some uh, you. We kind of said we are also in dialogue. Okay, is it from my own or is it from God? Okay. But sometimes we know so strong in our spirit that it was something that we said from God. So that also we have to test. So when you know for so so whatever we receive in the spirit, we have to test. But once you know that it is God, then you go with it. 
they don't have to doubt it, right? Um, especially when you, I, I want to use the word become familiar or you are able to recognize how the Holy Spirit is speaking to you, then it becomes easier. Yeah, that is the Holy Spirit. You recognize, you know, when the Holy Spirit is prompting you or giving you something, a word or revelation, then that itself is a test. Yeah, I know that's the Spirit of God. Uh, I, I go with it. If you're not sure, then you test it. It's okay. Holy Spirit, is that you or is it my own soul? Or is it just some strange idea coming from somewhere? You test that. And also be, uh, I think, when, when, when the matter is very serious, very important, or when the matter is affecting someone else, then we have to be more careful. Right? Suppose I get an idea, or some, something comes in my spirit. You move to Delhi, and start a church in Delhi. Now, I, that is a serious matter. I can't simply go and, because now I have to think about, okay, uh, is this really from God? Then what will happen? Who is going to be responsible for everything happening here? I have to think of all those things, right? So then I have to really test that. And uh, uh, really, you know, pray and make sure that is God. Otherwise, if I simply go, it will unnecessarily hurt whatever is happening here. But if it is God, then I have to obey God, right? So that is a serious matter. And it's affecting others also. So that one, if you really pray, you might, I will also discuss it with other pastors. I'll say, you all pray. Let us get the mind of the Lord on this. Let us make sure we make the correct decision. And then we make a decision. But if it is something simple, like, you know, you go and bless that person with some money, small thing. Okay, you know, whether right or wrong, the person will be happy. <laughs> You bless that person. So you know. So depending on what that leading is, you have to be careful how you test it and so. On. Okay. Last point here. We must also recognize that uh, demonic powers can affect the human spirit. So this is not in the case of the believer. We're talking about the unbeliever. Just a little comment here. Um, like we said, some people can be under the influence of evil spirits. Some people can be possessed. Some people can be empowered. So, for example, if somebody is causing trouble, uh, is coming against you, attacking you, persecuting you, this saying all these things, sometimes they can be doing out of jealousy or ignorance, but sometimes they can be under the influence of demonic powers. So why is that man attacking? Why is that man like, you know, that? why are they saying all this? Why they are they coming against us? And it could be there is demonic influence making them do that. So then we are not fighting flesh and blood. We deal with the influence. So you say, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over every spirit that's influencing that person or that community, people who are against. I bind those works. Command them to leave. Because it is not just them as human beings attacking or persecuting or coming against the believer. There's influence. Demonic influence. So you did to discern. Sometimes it's demonic possession. Okay, that means you know that person is really taken over by uh, evil spirit or spirits, and uh, they're manifesting. But there's also demonic empowerment. That means the enemy is giving that person power to do things, supernatural things. So they may be able to manifest some power, but where it is coming from? From the demon demons, giving them power to do it. Right? So that also had to discern. Uh, so they can even tell fortune. They may even tell your past or tell your pre future. Some some things. They say, uh, you were born this date. How do you know? <laughs> From where? Yeah. Uh, yeah. 
deliverance, healing, all those things. But remember, the Bible calls it lying signs and wonders. Different. It's coming from a demon power and uh, causing these kind of things. You know, so all these things are happening. We just have to recognize that. Right? And sometimes, for Samuel 28, they can impersonate, pretend to be somebody. Hello, I am Samuel, Prophet Samuel. <laughs> I've come to give you a prophecy. They can impersonate. So we have to be discerning. So, so oh, Prophet Samuel came and told me today. No, it's not Prophet Samuel. It's arm spirit that impersonates. Sometimes they can even appear like Jesus. Now appear like Jesus. So you some if you're not discerning, you think Jesus came to me today and gave me these words. Be careful. Because they can come in any form, like you know, impersonate. So we have to be careful, you know, the that the messengers of Satan appear like angels of light. Uh, they can come like any, they can impersonate and they pretend. And sometimes, you know, they affect the mind. They think, oh, I'm having a vision of some angel or Jesus or some prophet coming and talking. To be careful. Okay? The real test is, if it is the Holy Spirit, your spirit will bear witness. So, yeah, that is, that is the Holy Spirit. If it is not inside, you say, no, something is wrong can discern. It's not right. Something is wrong. Okay. Let me pause here. Any questions? Let me see online students. Any questions from online class? Okay. Let me just introduce the next lesson and then we will pause. We'll con Oh, sorry. Uh, there's one more question here. I forgot. Um, does God? Uh, let me share this. Sorry, there's one more portion. I will finish that today. So the question is: um, This is on page twenty. Does God harden the human heart? So the argument is like this, you know. You think about some examples, Pharaoh, think about Jacob and Esau, or Esau and Jacob. Think about uh, Judas Iscariot. Huh? So question is, did God make Judas go and betray Jesus? Because if Judas had not betrayed Jesus, Jesus would not have gone to the cross. And if Jesus didn't go to the cross, we would not be safe. So did God make Judas go and betray Jesus? And if God made Judas go and betray Jesus, then Judas can say, I did the greatest work. I cannot be called a sinner. I cannot be called a betrayer. Because I did the greatest work of uh, only then, only because of me, Jesus was crucified. So did God harden Pharaoh's heart? No. Or, or uh, what was the uh, Jake, uh, Esau and Jacob? You know, uh, yeah, uh, even before they were born, God said, "Jacob, I have loved; Esau, I have." Hated. So does that mean God already decided that he will hate Esau and he will choose Jacob? So these are questions that, yeah. and Paul addresses this uh, in, in, in Romans. But let me just summarize that. Um, so when, when, when the Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, when we look at it carefully in the book of Exodus, and I've given the verses here, that we see that Pharaoh actually he hardened his own heart initially as Moses kept coming. Pharaoh hardened his own heart. 
That means he chose saying, no, I will not give in to Moses. Who is he? Moses, God was working signs and miracles. But even though the miracles were happening, Pharaoh was choosing to say, no, I will not accept this. So initially, Pharaoh was hardening his own heart. Then God gave him up. Hello, Pharaoh, you want to do that? Go. So in that sense, when the Bible later says, the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, we must understand it in that sense. That means God gave him up, let him go. How you want to go? You want to go that way? Go. And that is consistent with the rest of Scripture. So even in Romans chapter 1, three times it says, God gave them up to their own ways. So it's not like God made them to go that way. He gave them up. And people chose to sin. And people chose to deny the truth and worship the creature instead of the creator. And people chose to uh, commit immorality. God gave them up. I was okay, you are going, I'll let you. So in that sense, we must understand that God hardened Pharaoh's heart or he gave them up. He didn't... He didn't Make Pharaoh harden his heart. What we see is Pharaoh started hardening his heart in the beginning. That means refusing to accept that God was working. And so then God said, okay, you go that way. Okay. For Jacob and Esau, we'll understand that God was speaking ahead of time what he saw Jacob and Esau do. So he was not determining their action. He was declaring their action, declaring what they will choose. He was declaring ahead of time that Esau would choose to gratify his natural desire instead of pursuing his spiritual birthright. So that's why he said, I love Jacob because he's pursuing the spiritual. I hate Esau because he's pursuing his own natural desire. So when God said ahead of time, Jacob, I have loved Esau, I have hated, he's not de deciding their decision. He's Declaring based on the decision they're going to make what you know what he loves and what he dislikes. Right? Same thing with Judas, right? God didn't make Judas go and deny Jesus. He knew ahead of time the choice Judas will make. That he was willing to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. But God would use that, the, the very act of Judas, to then unfold the crucifixion and all that he planned, right? So it's not like God made Judas go and betray Jesus. God knew ahead of time what Judas was going to do. And uh, he, he, you know, he used that to see the crucifixion happen, right? So we must understand it correctly. And therefore, we don't say, God is making me do wrong things, right? Or anybody do wrong. Okay, so we will uh, get into lesson number six uh, next week. Any questions before we close? Yeah, go ahead. Will God choose someone who is evil? Like we see in the, for example, Judas case. Yeah. Uh, we, uh, Judas has betrayed Jesus. Yes. And God knew it before. Yes. There is also prophecy in uh, Psalm. Yes. That uh, he will betray. So yeah. To fulfill that prophecy, God will choose someone. So the prophecy is God declaring ahead of time what is going to happen uh, because he has already seen it, right? So he's declaring it ahead of time. So the question is, could Judas have been like John or Peter or any one of the other apostles who did not, I mean, who did not say John, he never denied Jesus. Could Judas have been like John? And the answer is yes. He could have been like John, a faithful, beloved disciple. He could have been.
But Judas betrayed Jesus. Not because God made him do it. Not because God chose Judas and said, Judas, you come be one of the twelve. I need somebody to betray Jesus. But he saw ahead of time that one of Jesus' twelve disciples would betray him. And so he foretold that. One of my own has lifted his heel up against me or you know, I've been betrayed in the house of my friends. He foretold that. But it will be against free moral will to say that God chose Judas and made him do this. As though Judas had no choice to be like John, another beloved disciple. No. God knew ahead of time. He spoke ahead of time. Uh, he foretold it. But that is not in a sense of forcing Judas to do it, but it's in a sense of declaring that he will do this. But Judas, because otherwise what will happen is God will be working against free will, which is not right. He will not do that. Right. So let's think of another scenario. If all of the 12 apostles of Jesus were faithful, Nobody betrayed him. Could Jesus still have gone to the cross? Yeah. Because somebody else would have come. Maybe the soldiers would themselves would have come. Or a lot of people, the chief priests and all those other religious leaders were against Jesus. So somebody else would have taken him and put him on the cross. So the crucifixion would still have happened. So... Um, we cannot say that God made Judas do it. God foretold it because he saw it happening ahead of time. So we have to balance and respect free will and yet the foreknowledge of God and keep it together. And can we say that also be the same with uh, people nowadays? Even God knows that later they will be seen and then also the people will be away from. Like even like can it happen after God is for knowledge. Like, see who will lead him, but still choose them now. Yeah. So the invitation is open to everyone. Whoever responds to the invitation becomes the chosen chosen ones. But if somebody decides to deny and walk away from the faith, that's entirely their choice. You know. Did God know that it'll happen? Yeah, of course, He knows everything. But did God make it happen? No. That was still their choice. Go ahead. They are praying. They are praying. Yes, yes. Yeah, so they are praying to something or someone they may not know. Like Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, he says, Don't you know that the sacrifices with the Gentiles offer, they're actually offering it to demons. You know? They are offering it to the idol, but they're actually offering it to demons. First Corinthians 10, he says. So now they don't know that. They may think I'm doing this to some idol or some temple. But behind that, there is some, we, we, what we know is demonic past. Okay, let's close. Somebody can pray and close, and we'll dismiss. Amen. Amen. All right. Have um, a good day. Thank you. Bye.